welcome. Thank you guys for coming to our session today. Um, and we're pleased to host the auditor's office and Shauna Love, who's down here from Sacramento. Auditor's office in Sacramento has been connected with the Goldman School on campus for a very long time. Um, and would they have, there's a couple um, Goldman MPP graduates who are currently working there and um, are always happy to be a resource to folks. Um, the auditor's office, as she will explain in more detail, they kind of recruit from all disciplines and all degree levels and um, you kind of get onboarded according to you know what your degree level was. So we've gone ahead and invited a couple other departments as well as the public policy minors. Um, so I just so that Shauna has an idea of who's in the room, I see, I think I'm seeing like four different types of students in the room out of a group of five, which is awesome. So uh, I think we've got a couple undergrad public policy minors, is that right? So two nodding heads here. And then we've got a um, first year MPP student, correct? A joint degree student <laughs> with public health. Um, no. We've got, um, I'm not sure, Sean, I think we told you last month, we do have a mid-career um, MPA program. So we've got one student from that program. Excellent. Um, nice. And then two here in the back and over here are graduating MPP students this year. All so right. it's a great mix. I love it. Small <laughs> but mighty <laughs> mix of student types. Yeah. Um, right. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Shauna. She's got lots of fun information to share. Um, and take it away. Thank you so much. Thank you guys for coming. I know, especially in the rain and at this point in the semester, it's hard to make that time. I'm just going to come in a little bit closer. So my style is very informal. Um, I'm Shauna Love. I um, got a master's degree in public administration from San Francisco State University. I've been with the California State Auditor's Office now for about two years. Um, I am a recruiter. I'm not an auditor. Um, but I can tell you a lot about our auditing field, what the career profession is like, and I have some testimonials from folks who are actually in the role, so you can hear from them sort of indirectly what this job is about. So my presentation today is called The Coolest Career You've Probably Never Heard Of. Um, how many of you guys know something about the California State Auditor's Office? you have an idea of like what we do? I saw two hands go up. Yeah? You want to tell me a little bit what you think we do? Yeah. You know about our office? Yeah program evaluations of state programs, basically, mm -hmm. um, on behalf of, I think, well, it's an independent, you know, I, you independently select your yeah. research, basically. Yeah. yeah. Congratulations. You actually know more than anyone I've ever asked before. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Truly, most people, um, and what were you going to say? You're going to add on to that? One time, I met one of our MPP students who works there, and she just loves it so much. She was like, I just... I, I couldn't Lindsay, or Lindsay. She just loved it so much. She was just like, I just love auditing so much. <laughs> and I was really impressed by her enthusiasm. Right, right. Oh, that's, that's really I great. Also, I knew what Ben knew. I just mm -hmm. let him right. say it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Most of the time when I ask people if they know anything about our office, they go, yeah, it's like, it's finance, right? Or you guys do taxes. Mm -hmm. And some people think we're the state um, franchise tax board. And some people think that we're the Department of Finance. So I just start off the presentation by actually just kind of talking a little bit about who we are. Um, so we are actually a state government entity, right? We're not private sector. We are part of the state government infrastructure. And we work for the California State Legislature. So you were close, right? Um, our role is essentially to be the watchdogs for the state of California, right? So we're kind of like a watchdog agency. We do perform program evaluation. We don't necessarily use that term, although there are elements of that. They're very closely aligned. Oops, I'm rocking back on my heels here. Um, what we do is it's our job to go into different government agencies and determine the proper administration of programs, policies, and the, the organization as a whole, right? And when we're talking about what is proper administration, we're talking about efficiency, effectiveness, law, lawfulness, and things along those lines. So if there's any indication of like waste, fraud, mismanagement, abuse, that is to a substantive level where it warrants us going in and putting public funds into like going and assessing what's actually going on, that's when we go in, right? Minor things, we don't necessarily take action. We let that be handled on perhaps the county level or the local level or the organization level. So even though we're considered like the watchdogs for the state, right, this picture is a lot different than the last dog you saw, which looked like a mean dog baring its teeth. 
our organization doesn't really have teeth. Right? So we're not an enforcement body. We are a body that actually delivers information, like this cute little canine here. We deliver information to the California State Legislature upon which they make policy decisions right, that affect the entire, the entire state of California. And it's our job to make sure that that information is as objective, unbiased as possible, and accurate and timely. So you kind of hit upon this. We're independent, right? We're independent. We're considered independent and external, which seems very paradoxical, right? So we're part of California state government, and at the same time, we're considered independent. So how do we do that? How do we manage to stay in that space? So basically, we work for the California state legislature up to a point, right? So we work for them at the beginning of the audit and at the end of the audit. When they tell us, OK, hey, we had this audit request. It went through the Joint Legislative Audit Committee. It got approval. We're going forward with this. They give us our marching orders. We go out and we implement the audit. If they came back to us even two hours later and said, you know what, change of heart. We're actually not going to do that audit. Just cancel the whole thing. We tell them, sorry, we don't work for you anymore. Right? That's the point. As soon as they give us the audit directive, we no longer work for them. Now we work for you. We work for the people of California. That's how we're able to stay in this sort of paradoxical objective state. So what do we do? In our office, we have two different primary functions. One of them is investigations, which very few people know about. And what is investigation? So this is a unit that is dedicated to the Whistleblower Act. And so anywhere in the state of California, if you work as a California state employee or even just a member of the public, you have access to this whistleblower hotline. So if you suspect foul play, you can call that whistleblower hotline anywhere in the state of California and it comes to our office, right? So our folks will determine whether or not these allegations or these complaints are substantive enough to warrant a full investigation. Sometimes employees just want to call and complain about their boss. Right? So we screen all of those calls, we vet them, we assess them, and then we determine whether or not there needs to be an investigation. And if there should, we carry them out. Then we have our audit division. And our audit division is actually divided into three different branches. We have financial audits. Everybody knows what a financial audit is, right? It's exactly what it sounds like. Um, so we do financial audits, but ironically, it's less than a third of the work that we do. So when people hear audit and they go, oh yeah, that's finance, right? That's taxes, numbers, something like that. I'm like, yeah, it is, but it's actually less than a third of the work that we do. So of these three different audit branches, we have one that's um, dedicated to financial audits, and then we have two that are actually dedicated to performance auditing. So how many of you have heard of performance auditing? Right, this is, yeah, it's, it's kind of like, mm, sounds familiar, I think, it's, you know. And you're right, it's kind of like program evaluation. It's one of those things. So the coolest career that you've probably never heard of is performance auditing, and that's what we're going to focus on today. So what is performance auditing? It's kind of like an intersection between these four different things. There's an element of consulting, right? Um, a lot of what we do in terms of our process is exactly what consultants do, exactly. It's program evaluation to a certain extent, depends on the scope of the audit, right? What we're actually auditing could be organizational um, evaluation, again, depending on the scope of the audit. And there's almost always a compliance nature to it, but at least there's some aspects of the audit that will have a compliance component to it. But compliance audits are very different from the audits that we do. You guys know what compliance audits are, right? It's so when you have a checklist, and you're going through an organization and like, are they doing this? Yep, are they doing that? Yep, and you're just checking off the boxes, right? To make sure everything is in alignment. There's always an element of that, but that's not the kind of audits that we do in, as a whole. So performance auditing is sort of a mixture of all of those four things. An audit life cycle has four different phases, right? Four primary phases. The first starts off with pre-scoping. Um, and this is when you just you get the audit request from the legislature and you sit down and you're like, okay, what are they asking us to do? And you just sit down as a team and you just try to wrap your mind around it. And you decide things like what's the mission of the audit and what goals do we need to achieve? The second is scoping. So scoping is a lot like planning, right? Like project management where you sit down and you're like, okay, what resources do we need? Where are we gonna find these resources? What's the timeline gonna be like? All of those things. And you start planning it out. 
Field work is when you implement, and then you do the report processing. Okay? Report processing is probably the most tedious part of our audits. If you're going to have um, overtime anywhere in the audit life cycle, it's usually going to be at the end of the audit where you're pushing out that report. Okay? And every one of the reports has the elements of the finding. So when you think about it, what's, what goes in the reports? Just like the reports that you guys do in school, right? You talk about, um, you know, what you tell them what you're going to tell them, and then you tell them, and then you tell them what you just told them. It's that same kind of structure, right? So we start off with the elements of a finding with the criteria. And the criteria is like, well, if things were in the optimal state of being, right, at this organization, this program, or whatever you're looking at, how should things be going? Optimally, right? That's the criteria. Then you go and you assess the condition, right? This is when you go and you do your field work and you go into the auditee site and you find out what's actually going on here. And then the third, oh, that slipped. All right, and the, the next one is the, um, the effect, right? So what is the effect of this, right? So if there is a discrepancy between the way things should be and the way things actually are, what is the effect of that? And the cause, what is the incongruity? Like, why is there this incongruity? What are the contributing factors that created that? And then lastly, you make your recommendations, right? Nine times out of 10, when we go and we do an audit, we find something, right? Something's amiss. We wouldn't have gone in if there wasn't substantial, you know, uh, support for the fact that there's something going wrong there. So typically, those recommendations are remedial, right? How are we going to fix this problem? Now, why this job? What, what makes it so cool, right? You could work for a lot of other companies. You could be a lot of companies, private sector and public sector, have auditing functions, right? So what makes us different and what makes it special? One is the scope and the impact, right? So it's very rare, particularly if you're going into an entry-level position where you get to work on a project that's going to affect the entire state of California, right? The fifth largest economy in the world. But you can do that in your first year here. Um, it's also the, the impact in terms of how many people are affected, how many dollars are affected, and how long you're actually going to have that effect on people, right? So if a new law goes into place, it, it could be on the books for decades, and you were the one that was responsible for making that change, right? The voice and the access. There are not very many other jobs. Well, let me ask you guys, do you know of any job, entry level, where you can actually speak with a California state legislator and tell them how you think they should do their job better or what they could do to make the state run better? I don't know of any other job where you get to do that, but you do as an auditor in our office. You do it directly because we actually sit and talk with our state legislators. You do it indirectly through the audit report Right? When you put your recommendations forth and you contribute to that audit report, it goes directly to the state legislature. And they use that and they implement about 85% of the recommendations that we make. It's pretty phenomenal, right? And not only that, but throughout the audit process, you're talking to the auditees. And the auditee company or organization, you're speaking with high-ranking officials like all throughout the state of California. So you get that kind of access to where you get really comfortable talking to elected officials, talking to high-ranking officials throughout the state. And then there's the variety. And this is the part where I think you guys are going to geek out the most, right? <laughs> Especially those of you that are in grad school. Um, I do this presentation for a lot of um, people at the master's degree and PhD level. And one thing I know about you guys and anyone actually who's here at UC Berkeley, you love to learn, right? You love to learn and you get excited by that intellectual rigor. In our office, you're going to be working on a different audit every, like, on average six months. And every audit that you work on, you have to become the subject matter expert. So let's say we're, um, there's an audit that we did on the foster care system. And we weren't auditing the entire foster care system. We were looking at one aspect of one program. And it was um, the administration of psychotropic drugs to kids in foster care who had mental health diagnoses. Right? And so what we found is that they were being overprescribed medication. So no one in our office is a pharmacist. Right? No one in our office is an MD. No one in our office is a sociologist. But they had to get up to speed right, with all of that and become the expert. And so you'll get topics like that that range from you know, anything within the world of, of the public sector, uh, public sector. And 
you'll find yourself always learning something new and always being challenged, which is really awesome. So here's an example of three audits that we did very recently. The first one is Homelessness in California that was published in April of 2018. You guys may have seen um, some news articles. I put a couple of clippings here from the news about each one of these reports. But this one was really exciting to me because we had a team of people, right, that went in to do this, this audit. And it started with one legislator from Southern California who said, hey, you know, homelessness is a real problem in LA County. We really need to take a closer look. We need to find out like how we can do things better because we're failing. And so they got the audit approved. They came to us. We went to execute. We put together a team of, I think, six people. They went down to LA. They started doing their field work. They started to assess the condition. And what they found is that it was so complex, right, between funding, and from the federal to the state to the local level to the distribution of services and how things were allocated, it was so complex. They said, you know what, we can't just focus on LA. It's not, it's not an LA county, it's not a countywide problem. So they actually decided as a team to go back to the state legislature and request permission to augment the scope. And they got permission to do that. So again, when I started thinking about that, I'm like, I don't know of any other job where you can get assigned a territory, like even if you were a salesperson, right? And they said, okay, well, your territory is all of San Francisco County, and you can go back and say, actually, I want to do the whole state. Can you just give me the whole state? And they're like, yeah, okay, go ahead, right? I don't know of any other job where you can do that, but that's what actually happened in this case. They said, you know, we want to, we want to audit the entire state. And the legislature said, go ahead, do that. So they did it, they published the report, they provided their recommendations, and as soon as Governor Newsom, uh, Governor, <laughs> as soon as Gavin Newsom uh, came into office at the beginning of this year, he started acting on those recommendations. Right? Again, 85% of the recommendations that we offer get implemented. Um, the second one was California High Speed Rail. Raise your hand if you saw this all over the news. Right? This was all over the news earlier this year. Um, we published that report in November of 2018. Um, Governor Newsom came into office at the beginning of this year and immediately started to implement those recommendations. And what did he do? He just shut down high-speed rail, right? Because it was a mess, right? For the most part, there, the part um, in the Central Valley, I think there's like a short segment that he, he said, we're too far in. We're going to go ahead and finish this, but the rest of it, it's done. It's a wrap, right? So we're talking about millions and actually billions of dollars on that project. The last one um, that I'm highlighting here is the Department of Motor Vehicles, and this is a report that we published back in April of 2017. Um, and this one, again, it was all over the news, as a lot of our audits do. It, uh, you know, and it's really a bonus of working on an audit that gets this kind of like press that has your name attached to it too. So it's another thing to consider about why it's so cool to work for our office. Um, this one was all over the news because it was an investigation and we actually did almost like a sting operation, <laughs> right? Where we had people out in parking lots and overseeing like what was going on and just checking and monitoring to see how people were using and abusing the handicap placard um, program. And what they found is that there was gross mismanagement and a lot of abuse of these handicap placards. And so as a result, we published the audit report, we gave the recommendations, and DMV immediately started to overhaul the entire program and make things better for people who really depend on this service, right? Hi. And I just also want to um, call out that two of those are NLPES Impact Award winners. So the, those are national awards. And here's a list, and this is a short list, of some of the other awards that our offices um, won. And it's, again, it's really cool to work for an office where you know the standard of the work that they're doing is so excellent that they're being recognized nationally on a consistent basis. All right, so that's enough about me and what I have to say about the office. What do our actual auditors say, right? So I actually sent out an email to about 15 different auditors representative of people you know, at different levels of the organization, different tenure, and I asked them, you know, why do you like working here? And why do you stay, right? And so this is the feedback that I got. Eric Cherwin is an A1, he just started, right? That's our entry level position. He started in July of last year, so about a year and a half. 
Um, he says he loves not only how they get to offer their own perspective when they're making these recommendations, but actually get to work with the auditees, right? They get to work with the staff at the auditee site and help them to brainstorm. So they're not just coming in and saying, okay, we looked at it and we're offering our outside perspective and then we're gonna make you guys try to comply with it. But they're actually talking to people about what is going on from your perspective and what do you think is gonna make things better? And they come up with solutions together. And again, Eric um, is one of the many, many happy geeks in our office who says he loves learning. He loves learning, and that's going to be a consistent theme. Katrina Solario is a senior auditor one. She's been with our office since 2002. And she's really cute. She categorized her responses by amazing, impressive, and really cool. <laughs> So what she finds amazing, intriguing, and exciting actually is learning. She loves learning about all the different state agencies, what's actually going on in state government, how things operate, what the, the challenges are, and then finding those solutions. Um, impressive and rewarding is developing the meaningful and impactful recommendations that actually improve public policy throughout the state. And really cool, she loves the opportunity to learn all the different subject matter right, that we cover in our office. Travis Holtby, he's an AE2. He's been with our office for a little over two years. Travis loves solving wicked problems. He loves intellectual rigor, right? And he says, after this, it's hard to ever imagine working somewhere where the only problem we work on is how to sell more widgets and make more money, right? Like you can never step back from that kind of excitement that he has in this role. Um, and he also loves his colleagues. He said he's worked in a lot of different jobs before, but he's never worked with so many people that were so bright and so committed to making a difference in the state of California. Joaquin is an AE2, and you can see he's already been promoted and he's been with our office a little less than a year. Um, he said even as a rookie auditor, you can improve California government. The state legislature, at the time that I got this quote, which was just like two months ago, he said the state legislature just passed a bill incorporating many of the recommendations that he himself put forth in his very first audit. That's powerful. Um, again, coworkers, intelligent, dedicated, deeply care about the work that they're doing, and the learning. He says, you're not an expert, you will be soon. Just give it time. And the range of different topics range from the things like boring things or you know, the most mundane, like just budgets and contracts, to the abstruse, like mattress recycling and strawberry breeding. So we work on a lot of really cool things, but not everything is exciting, right? Some things are very mundane. You might be working on water rates in some city you never heard of. It's not super exciting. The good news is that audit is gonna last four to six months, and then you're gonna move on to something else. And so you know that within the course of like a year or two, you're gonna be working on something that's deeply meaningful to you in a very personal way and something that you're really excited about. So Dale is a principal and you'll see on our um, career ladder, which I'm gonna show you in just a moment, each one of our branches is headed by a deputy and each, under each deputy is a principal. And so Dale is you know, pretty high up in our organization. He's been with the office since 1985. Um, and he's a very practical person. He says he loves that it's project-driven work with a very clear start, middle, and ending. Um, he loves having a cogent work product, right? Something you could just really wrap your mind around. Um, and the favorite quote here at the end, he says, I could have retired five years ago, but this is still fun for me, right? And so I sent out this email to everyone, and everyone responded to me via email except for Dale. Dale emailed me back and he said, Hey, Shauna, you got like 10 minutes? I'll come up and talk to you. And I thought, Wow, you know, he's senior management. He's going to take time out of his day to respond. He could have just sent me an email. And so we sat down and we talked for probably 20 minutes. And this was like the final thing that he said at the end. And he literally said it just the way it sounds. He's like, yeah, I could have retired five years ago. This is still fun for me, you know? And I said, Dale, can I quote you on that? He was like, yeah, sure, go ahead. <laughs> All right, so in addition to the work, right, and the experience that you have, um, what is it like, you know, as an employee? Like, what do we have to offer as an employer to each one of you? So our office, we offer a lot of training and professional development and support if you want to advance your career getting certificates, 
um, or licenses, right? Mentorship, benefits and bonus, and merit-based promotion. So we're gonna go into those a little bit more. Professional development, um, we give educational reimbursements and we give you two days off a year, um, paid days off for professional development. Bonuses, so if you decide that you want to get one of these licenses or certificates, say you decide you want to become a CPA or you want to become an internal fraud investigator, um, and you get that license, we will give you a $4,800 bonus for up to two licenses. And we give you reimbursement up to $2,000 for a prep course or for a review course, right? So if you're gonna become a CPA, there's actually a, a review course that you do before you take your uh, test for the license. That can cost up to $2,000 and we'll give you up to $2,000 to cover it. We have what we consider to be very competitive salaries. So we did a compensation analysis, um, I wanna say a year and a half ago, and um, they compared salaries across the country and different state audit shops and different government agencies at the federal, state, and local level. And they also compared it to um, private sector. And so, you know, we can't always match what you would make in the private sector, right? But we're very competitive in the public sector. So our salaries, um, we feel very confident that we're giving people something that they can feel proud of, right? When they start working with our office. And there's an entry level salary and that is for, well, there's two salaries at the entry level. One is for undergrad and one's for grad school, right? So even if you are at the graduate level, you'll be starting in at the same level, but you'll be paid more, okay? And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, I'm not gonna go into depth about all these other benefits um, for a few different reasons. One, it's gonna take too long, and number two, our executive office actually does not like us to talk too much about the benefits because we don't wanna draw people in on that alone. Everybody knows when you work for government, there's great benefits, right? They're all available at CalHR if you wanna know more. But let's take a look at our career ladder, and this is on our website. So Auditor 1, it's actually Auditor Evaluator 1 is the full um, title. And those numbers have actually changed. So this is what's on our website, but we, we haven't updated it yet. Entry level is now at like 61. Um, and if you have a graduate degree, it's a little over 66,000. But once you're in that paid band, um, you can go up to 87, I think it is now, that paid band has changed. And so these are the positions. It's Auditor 1, Auditor Evaluator 2, Senior 1, 2, and 3, and then Principal. And then the next step would be deputy of that particular branch. So I want to point out that movement across this ladder can happen fairly rapidly. So no matter where you start with us, and we usually start everyone at Auditor 1, no matter what your background is in terms of experience or education, and the reason for that is because auditing as we perform it in our office is so different from auditing in a lot of other offices, okay? Whether it's government or private sector. I actually just had a conversation with somebody from Human Resources yesterday, um, and she was explaining to me that even people who have like five or six years of auditing experience for a different state agency would still have to start at Auditor 1 in our office because what they've been doing does not align with what we do, okay? We spend this first like year of immersing people in our culture and training them, giving you comprehensive training on what we do and how we do it. Now, if you come and work for us, you can take what we do and take it anywhere else. It just doesn't really work in the reverse. But this jump from AE1 to AE2 can happen very quickly. Um, and we give, like I said before, merit-based promotions. So it's not about tenure like it is in most government agencies and in a lot of companies. Like, we have been here a long time, we're going to promote you just because, right? We only do merit-based promotions, which means you actually have to deserve it. And the good news is that it is possible, and I've actually seen it happen once in only two years I've been with the office, where somebody got promoted before they were even done with their probation. So they were, probation is a year, and after like six or seven months, one of our employees got a promotion. So it really is merit-based. Typically that jump from AE1 to AE2 happens within a few months after probation, right? So you're looking at maybe you know 14 months or so. You can theoretically jump the next two within the next three to four years, depending on your performance, okay? And we do have somebody in our office who's a senior two, and she's been with the office for, I think, five years. 
So what do we look for? <laughs> and who do we hire? In our office, because we start everybody off at the same position, um, the minimum qualification is just a four-year degree in any subject. All right? And when I say that, I know it's kind of an insult to people that are at the graduate school level. Like, mm, you know, don't put me on par with people who just have an undergrad degree. I've worked a lot harder, and I can relate to that. I know it's a really hard sell. Um, and it makes it seem like it's really easy to get a job with us, but in fact, it's really difficult. Um, the year that I first started with this office, I did a bunch of data analysis to really understand performance in our office and what they had been doing in terms of recruiting and hiring. And I found that the year before, we had somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,400 people who created a profile on our website, which is the start of the hiring process. They created a profile, and then from there, it dropped down to somewhere like 800 people who actually took the exam. So we had 800 people who took an exam to apply for this position. Then from there, a lot of people failed the exam. We have something like a 45% fail rate for our exam. So it's really strenuous. And then um, it dropped off to like maybe 125 people that actually even made it to the writing assessment. And then we did all of that. It started off with like 1,400 people to fill 30 positions. So that's how competitive it is. And so even though our MQ is really low, it's a very rigorous vetting process. Um, and so in addition to that, that minimum qualification of a four-year degree, we're looking for a lot of different characteristics and we're looking for um, alignment. So this is, believe it or not, a short list. <laughs> this is a short list of some of the things that we look for in our candidates. Um, all of the things that you see on here, some of them are gonna seem like, okay, that's what everybody's looking for. That's, that's to be expected, right, from any employee. The difference with our office is that the bar is just set really high, okay? So when we talk about being analytical and having critical thinking skills, we set the bar really high and we test for it and we vet for it throughout the entire hiring process. But also, um, what's equally as important is those soft skills. So before I came on board, um, what I was told <laughs> um, by our executive office, we were in the midst of strategic planning and we were doing all of this like introspection and evaluation of ourselves as an organization. And one of the things that our executive office discovered is that we had a lot of really, really smart people, right? Um, it's one of the things that we can boast about. We have some really, really smart people, but we have also had a lot of people who had all of the technical skills and the, 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 the smarts but they didn't have any people skills. So they had no ability to just have a conversation like, and relate to people. And so here I am, a brand new employee, and part of the reason why they hired me is because I'm so not traditional government, right? I'm not the person who usually shows up like in a black suit. I'm not the person who's like really conservative. I don't fit the image of what most people think of when they think of auditors or when they think of government. Um, and they really wanted to, to shift the perception of the office and get people who are, um, some people have used the term, just normal, <laughs> right? Just normal people who know how to talk <laughs> and know how to converse with other people. Um, and why do you guys think that's so important in this role? Because you're, you're talking to people all the time, right? From the, the beginning to the end of the audit process and then even beyond that, you are talking to legislators, you're talking to the JLAC committee, you're talking to people at the auditee site, from rank and file to senior leaders, right? And so you have to be able to have those kind of interactions under duress, oftentimes, right? Because nobody wants to be audited, right? And so this is one of the big differences too, right, between us and, and working in the private sector. Um, if you're a consultant and you're working for a private sector firm, Somebody's going to hire you to come into their organization and help them run things better and make more money. So when you walk in the door, they're really happy to see you, right? They're like, good, you're here. Get to work. Make us some money. Um, in our office, not so much. As I explained before, when we walk in the door, it's because we suspect there's something wrong and we're there to figure out what it is. And so people are on the defense and they're oftentimes not very, um, not always cordial, not always forthcoming with information. And you have to be able to have very difficult conversations under um, very uncomfortable circumstances with people. So we look for those people who have professional maturity, who are very confident, who can speak well um, and interact with people well, on top of the fact that it's, it's you know, 
it's governments. You have to be mission driven, right? And not just mission driven necessarily in the big broad sense, although that's really nice, but people who can really embrace our mission and get behind what we're doing. So what does this look like on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Um, so the great thing is it's government, so you're not gonna be working 11, 12, 14 hour days, maybe sometimes, but rarely. Um, it's typically an eight hour work day, unless you do an RDO or an 880, we call it, where you work nine eight hour days, one eight hour day, and then you have one day off every other week. Um, it's usually a Friday. Your lunch break is the only thing we don't pay for lunch. So if you have a 30 minute lunch, you'll be at the office for eight and a half hours, but you're only working eight, right? But it'll extend your day by however long your lunch break is, 30 minutes or an hour. And so I asked um, a bunch of different auditors to describe their day, right? Because people ask me this a lot when I'm out in the field recruiting. What's a day actually like? And the truth is it's different depending on where you are in the audit cycle, right? So if you're in pre-scoping, your day's gonna look very, very different than if you are doing field work versus when you're doing like risk review and pushing out an audit report. So what I did is I kind of like, I took all this information from folks and I just kind of mashed it all up and got an overall sense of what an average day might look like and this is what it is. Average day, wake up around six, leave the house around seven. If that were me, I would need at least two hours to get ready. So, you know, you can personalize this, um, adjust it to yourself. Um, leave the house around seven. A lot of people take public transportation. We have parking in our building. It's about 25 bucks a day. Um, but we have public transportation all around us. So for example, I take the light rail gold line and there's a stop right across the street from our office, which is really nice. But then we have bus stops all over as well. So if you want to take public transportation, it's very convenient. Um, and we get a transit subsidy. So the state actually pays for the most part of my commute, right? Um, get to the office around eight o'clock. Most people start off by checking calendar, email, and voicemail, and they write down all the tasks that are associated with them, just like a standard best practice, right? Um, they combine all of those tasks with a to-do list that they created the night before. And of course, it's gonna vary by where you are in the audit cycle. But for example, scoping. Um, so if you're at the scoping phase, you're gonna be identifying the criteria and creating what we call a testing spreadsheet to test against like the condition and the criteria. If you're in the field work stage where you're actually out in the field doing data collection, interviewing our auditees, that sort of thing, um, you're gonna be doing a lot of uh, contact with the auditee, whether it's over the phone or in person. You're gonna be obtaining information, exchanging information, and verifying information, right? That's what that's all about. Risk review is at the end of the audit cycle. This is when you're actually getting ready to push that report out. Um, and we do what we call indexing the report and doing work papers to um, appropriate evidence. So indexing is a lot like creating that, um, what is it, in the back of your reports, the bibliography, right? Or like just citing all of the sources that you have for every fact that you put in your report, right? Only with our office, it's a much more tedious uh, and exact, precise process. About 9.30, teamwork. Teams range between three to seven people, depending on the audit and we typically have regular check-ins with the team. So one of the great things about being an auditor in our office is you're always gonna be working in a team environment. So no one's ever just kind of operating solo. You always have somebody to bounce your ideas off of, somebody to ask questions to, that sort of thing. A lot of collaboration and problem solving. 11 o'clock meetings with the auditees, the executive office. Um, the great thing about our audit process too is it's very inclusive. So we don't go into an auditee's work site and assess everything that's going on and then come back to our office and write up a whole bunch of notes about them and then hit them with this audit report and go, bam, surprise. Like we don't operate that way. We actually include our auditees in every step of the audit process, right? So as we're moving through, as we're going and we're finding information, we let them know this is what we're finding. This is what we're thinking. This is how we're interpreting this, right? And it's, so it's always like a two-way dialogue not only with our auditee, but also with our executive office. So they stay informed throughout the entire audit cycle. 12.30, lunchtime. 
Um, we are very fortunate for a state government agency, particularly in Sacramento, where there's so many state government agencies and most of them are in old state government buildings. We are actually in the U.S. Bank building, which is a brand new private sector building that is very environmentally friendly and um, also has a gym on the ninth floor. So when it comes to lunchtime, a lot of folks like myself, we will eat at our desk and work as we eat, and then we'll, for our lunch, we'll go to the gym, right? Um, for people who want a real break, there are break rooms on every floor, and there's a lot of eateries in the area, right? So we're downtown Sacramento. We're right by the Golden One Center. Whenever there's like a big, you know, um, venue like that, there's all sorts of like cute little shops that, that pop up around it. So we have a, like a nice little transit village and things like that with great little cafes and restaurants. Um, so lots of places to eat at lunch. Around one o'clock, back from lunch, more tasks, phone calls, email, timekeeping. Um, auditors with the California State Auditor's Office have to account for every minute of their day. Okay, so we talked about investigations earlier. One of the investigations that we do on a routine level is called improper activities. And you guys may have seen some news coverage about that and didn't even know what it was. Um, but we actually audit employees who do things like take a, uh, like abuse state time, right? So in one of our last investigations that we did of improper activities, there was a employee who was sleeping at his desk for like three or four hours a day, right? Not for a week, not for a couple weeks, but this went on for months and months and months until somebody finally called that whistleblower hotline. Um, we had employees who were like watching YouTube for hours and hours every day, right? Like I'm talking like 40, 50 hours of YouTube every month that kind of thing. So we have to be very careful because we are the watchdogs for the state of California. We have to make sure that we are living up to the same standard that we're holding everybody else to and actually even above that. So our auditors have to account for every minute of their time and that takes time. So that timekeeping, that's what that's referring to. Around 4.45, we evaluate those completed tasks and make a plan for tomorrow. And again, this is just another one of those best practices that people have figured out. Like this helps them to operate at their best. At the end of the day, they write a to-do list for themselves so that when they walk in the morning and they're still like half awake and haven't had their coffee yet, they know exactly what to do, right? It's not a matter of like, oh, I had to remember anything. It's like, nope, my day's already organized. I know what I have to do. Five o'clock, time to head home. Now, some people head home some people don't. <laughs> Again, we have the Golden One Center right there um, behind our building. And so there's always a lot of attractions going on there, whether it's a comedy show or you know the Sacramento Kings playing, that sort of thing. We're right downtown and within like, I don't know, maybe a 10 minute walk is the area called Midtown, which is like the hip area of Sacramento where like all the lounges and microbreweries and all that kind of fun stuff is all located. So you're very close to all of that if you want to take advantage of that after work. Um, and that's, that's a day in the life, okay? That's what it looks like to actually be in our office. And this is how you get to our office. <laughs> it's that long multi-step application process that people dread in government. We try to make it as painless as possible, but as I said before, our vetting process is very rigorous. Um, so I, I tend to overemphasize some things as I start talking about this, so forgive me in advance as I do this. You can go online to our website, and in the back there, you guys, where you signed in, there's a little flyer and it has our website, okay? There's a lot of auditing positions within the state of California, and you can go to Cal Careers and get confused and apply for the wrong job, okay? The only way that you can apply for a job with our office is at that website. Okay, so please make sure you grab one of those flyers and my business card. You can actually go on our website, create a profile anytime. All right, it takes about 10 minutes, so you might actually just want to do it as soon as you leave here. The next thing is you take the exam, um, and that just reopened in November. It's going to stay open. The last I was notified from HR, they're going to probably keep it open for about two or three months. Um, and as I said, that exam. It's geared towards anyone with a four-year degree in any subject because that's our minimum qualification, right? And at the same time, we have what I think is a very high fail rate, 45% roughly. Um, and that's people at the master's degree level and PhD level as well that fail this exam. Um, so bring your best to it. 
I'm not allowed to tell anybody what's on it or anything about it. What I can tell you is that it is an SAT type of an exam. So pull out your old SAT prep book or get one from the library or GRE prep book, something like that. I think that part of the reason why people fail this exam is because it's been so long. Well, first of all, those kind of exams just, they're awful, right? <laughs> they're just awful. Um, but the other thing is, like, by the time you're finishing your undergrad degree or graduate degree, you haven't done a test like that in a very long time, right? So it's worthwhile to just get one of those prep books and refresh on the content and that, that style of testing. You'll get your exam results within um, two to three business days, and it will tell you where you rank. Okay, so you have to be in the top three ranks in order for your application to be considered. You can still submit an application if you're below the top three ranks, but we won't look at it. So that's just perfectly honest. Um, so you wanna bring your A game to that exam, all right? So if you pass and you're in the top three ranks, then you can uh, complete and submit the job application, which just reopened on Monday. Um, and that's, uh, you know, standard application. Once you actually submit the application, now you're officially in our hiring process, okay? Prior to that, you're not officially in our hiring process. Those are just the, pre the preliminary steps. Um, after the application, you're gonna have a writing assessment. I think those of you that are at the graduate level might have a little bit of more of an advantage over undergrad. In undergrad, are you guys doing a lot of case study analysis? Depends. Depends, okay. So this exam is very similar to case study analysis. I am allowed to tell you that. Um, the reason why, like, the work that we do is, like, we do real-life case studies, right? That's, that's what the job is, all right? So we're testing to see how well you can structure a program. No, that's not what I wanted to say. Structure a problem and identify a problem and come up with solutions and how you're going to convey that information in the most succinct way possible, right? So that's what that test is about. Um, and again, we have another high fail rate for this writing assessment as well. It's very um, challenging, so bring your A game to that. Uh, if you do well, the next step is the phone interview. Phone interviews are all conducted in our office by one person. One person who has done thousands of phone screens, okay? So I tell people, um, it's almost as if she can see you through the phone. <laughs> So this is not a time to think, okay, this is just a quick chat, and you know, based on this chat, you know, it's just one step to get to my, my in-person, and then I'll knock it out on the in-person. You have got to show up for this phone screen the same way that you would if you were showing up in-person and meeting with some of our senior leaders, okay? So phone screen, then comes the in-person interview. Um, after that, we'll do the background check and job offer, and we are hoping to onboard people early in 2020. Um, and when I say early 2020, it's more than likely going to be around February or March. Probably not January, okay? They're graduating in May. Uh-huh, exactly, which is it. Can they stall their onboarding for the next cycle? Nope, well yes and no. So what my follow-up to that is, you can apply for a job with our office up to nine months before you graduate, okay? So if you're finishing up in May, you can still start at this hiring cycle we will hold the position for you until after you graduate, okay? And you, even if we made you an offer in January or February, you don't, that doesn't mean you have to start immediately after you graduate. If you need a month to decompress, to visit family, or to, you know, whatever you wanna do, we can hold the position for you, okay? We typically have like two onboarding sessions in the spring and then through the summer. Last year, I think one was in May, which would be probably too early for all of you and then another one in, I think it was July of last year. This year we may tweak the dates a little bit. We're trying to make it as convenient as possible. We've, like I said, we did some strategic planning, so a lot of things are kind of in flux in our office and we're trying to you know, tweak it and get things right. Um, part of that has to do with the scheduling and the dates, but don't let your graduation date um, be a deterrent to start the hiring process now, okay? And so that actually is the end of that presentation. Um, so did you guys have any questions that you'd like to ask? Yeah. What's the process for determining which projects will be on? Like say that I have content area expertise in uh, the national parks or something else. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, how, what, is that taken into consideration or do you just get um, 
put on whatever card I have available? Yes and yes. So it is taken into consideration among other factors. So auditors don't get to choose which audits they're assigned to. They just get assigned to an audit. However, if you are available and there is an audit that aligns with your area of interest or expertise, that will be taken into consideration, particularly if it's something very specific, right? So we have people in our office who have degrees in um, sustainability, right? Environmental science and things like that. So if we have an audit that that is a core dimension of the audit, we definitely want anyone in the office who has that expertise to be assigned, right? So yes, we leverage that as often as we can. If you're already on another audit and you're not available, I think that would be handled on an ad hoc basis. And maybe I missed it, but are, are people usually working on one audit at a time or are they staffed on multiple? Um, and how long is the average or amount of time that an audit takes place? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's one audit at a time. And each audit is, on average, six months. It could be as little as four. It could be as much as eight to 10. It depends on the scope of the, the audit and the complexity. Yeah. Any other thoughts or questions? Yeah. So uh, I'm an undergrad. Like, uh, I have a, a year mm -hmm. graduate. I live in minor public policy, so I would should just consider it as important the following year, right? Definitely. Okay, so definitely. It's not open to the graduation of 2021 is going to be next year. Uh -huh. And so here's the thing about our exam. Um, since it's such a difficult exam, there's really no harm in taking the exam, seeing how well you do. Your exam results are only going to be good for nine months, after which time you have to retake it. Um, so let's say you pass the exam, and you're like, oh, well, okay, that's great, but I have to retake the exam. At least you have the comfort of knowing that when you're going to take it again, you know you can pass it, right? Rather than waiting until, like, just before you really, really need to, a job and taking it and finding out that you needed to, you know, strengthen some of your skill sets in, in different areas, right? So um, it, it's entirely up to each individual, but that's an option. And is it the case that the score is valid for nine months and after that it expires, you have to redo it. But if, say, someone didn't get into those tiers and they want to retake it like a few weeks later, are they allowed to or do they have to wait nine months before they can take it again? The score is valid for nine months whether you pass or fail or no matter what your score is. Yes, you cannot retake it before nine months. Yes, but that's a good question. <laughs> and just to kind of, sorry. Before I forget, um, just to confirm with some of the timeline stuff that I think you mentioned to me beforehand was, so both right now the exam is open and the, the full-time application just opened this week, neither of which have are noted with a quote deadline, but they could close at any time? Yeah, so um, originally uh, when, before we actually opened up the application I was told that it was going to remain open until filled and then I saw something this week that said it was going to remain open until December 24th so I think they've updated that already so there is a limited time for the application which means that you have to get through those initial steps as quickly as possible so that you can make the application window winter break is a great time to do all this stuff but January might be too late so yes. this is a uh, early winter break uh, if not squeezing in some steps yeah. before you're 100% done on campus potentially and then the other thing is that there will likely be another round in late spring is that yeah yeah, so there will probably be another application um, opened up in the spring, perhaps in March or April. Um, right now what we're doing is we're going to determine how many people we get in our December hiring and how many of those people are qualified, you know, that we actually want to offer a position to. And based on the outcome of this recruiting cycle, it's going to determine if and when we open up again in the spring. My guess is it's very likely that we will open up again in the spring. And hypothetically, people applying that might be onboarding in September, or would it be later? Uh, yeah, it would probably be um, late summer, probably be August. Yeah. Yeah. Is this an exam in person, or is it an online? It is an online exam. Okay. Yes, and you have, I think, two hours to complete it. Okay. And then another question I had was just about kind of the team structure. So how many 
people get staffed to a project? Does it depend? Do they have kind of very distinct roles, or is everyone kind of working together on kind of the whole process? Mm -hmm. It depends on the, the audit itself, right? Um, so it can range anywhere from three to seven people that are assigned to an audit. Typically, there's um, one principal, one supervisor, and then um, you know some lower level AE1, AE2s. Um, on any audit. They do divide and conquer. It's entirely up to the supervisor to determine what role each person is going to have on any particular audit um, based on their strengths and interests and, and availability. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, if that's all the questions, then I'll just say thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Appreciate your time and coming out here on a cold, rainy day. Oh, thank you. Thank you.